Welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, brought to you by TheVirtualInstructor.com. And now, let's get sketchy. Hello there, everyone. Over here, I am. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, the greatest live broadcast on all of YouTube. I'm glad all of you are joining us here live at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Well, I'm just saying that, but you guys are all over the world in different time zones, so I'm glad that you are joining us live. Or maybe you're watching this sometime in the future, either way. We're glad to have you along with us as we go on a ride tonight. Uh, first of all, <laughs> let me explain what Getting Sketchy is. Getting Sketchy is where either me or my good friend and fellow artist, Ashley Hurst, we try to create a drawing for you inside of 45 minutes. We have a timer and everything. And of course, we try to throw some a uh, little bit of instruction in there as well. And this season, what we are doing is we are creating artworks in the style of dot, dot, dot. So we are creating artworks in the style of artists throughout history. Uh, last week, I did Janet Fish. And if you missed that, that video is available on YouTube, of course. And this week, Ashley is gonna be doing a different artist and I'm gonna let him tell you who that is. So Ashley, how are you doing over there? I'm doing great, Matt. Um, nice to be with you all. Nice for you to see the front of my face instead of the side of it. It's probably my best side. Uh, but any, I think my best side is my back side. Uh, but in any case, um, we are going to be checking out Dolly tonight. If you looked at the references, I know it seems a little weird, um, but I'll be glad to explain before we get started. Dolly's one of my favorite artists. I think he's probably more popular now than ever before. And of course, he was a, a 20th century artist. I had done Piranesi um, in my previous drawing, which was an artist from hundreds of years ago. So I thought I would move a little bit closer to the present and pick a 20th century artist. So we're going to take a look at a few pictures and then discuss the references and materials um, and quickly get into it. All right, and we'll get into uh, that material in just a minute. But of course, this is live on YouTube, so you can I use the chat box, of course. We'd encourage you to use the super chat function. Uh, when you use the super chat function, your, your uh, comment or question is highlighted and it shows up real big on the screen for me to, to read, of course, and we can answer those uh, comments and questions for you. And it does cost a little bit of money, but it helps us out, of course, with our broadcast and it shows your support for us as well. Uh, if you like this video, of course, I'd encourage you to like it. And if you haven't yet, subscribe to the YouTube channel. It's absolutely free to do that. And if, of course, if you wanna take your drawing and painting skills to another level, uh, we have the membership program over at thevirtualinstructor.com. Uh, there's a variety of drawing and painting courses on just about any subject matter or media that you can imagine over there for you. Plus we do weekly live lessons. So after getting sketchy, uh, we're going to continue in a series that Ashley is leading us through on distortion. The live lessons are an hour long each week and we create finished pieces of artwork there. So it's a slower pace and uh, maybe a little bit more of a professional pace <laughs> over there as well. Um, plus there's weekly critiques as part of the Members Minute and there's also a year long curriculum for visual arts teachers. So if you're a teacher out there and you're looking for additional resources, uh, in fact, the entire curriculum is planned out for you for an entire school year. Uh, so everything you need to teach is there. All of that is included as part of the membership program. There's a link in the description below this video if you want to check it out. Everyone starts out with a week-long trial for free, so you can see if the program's right for you. And uh, if you just want to take a look at a few courses and videos for free, there's a link for that below this video as well. And that will also put you on our mailing list, so uh, you'll get a bunch of free lessons sent to you. Plus, you'll be notified when I publish a newsletter, which I do about every month. Sometimes it's every couple of months, but uh, it's packed with all the new lessons and stuff that I've added to the virtualinstructor.com. Again, those links are provided for you below. There's also a couple of links to the materials Ashley is going to be using in the description below this video. I think I put those in. Maybe I didn't. <laughs> I can't remember if I put them in or not. Um, anyway. Uh, I, I encourage you guys to check that stuff out. Plus, if you want uh, to have the photo references that Ashley is using tonight, because there's two, uh, you can find them on the community tab at the YouTube channel. So if you click on the little icon of my face, that'll take you to the channel. And if you look for the community tab, you'll see that photo reference there. Um, so you can use it alongside us. We'll have the photo reference up during tonight's broadcast, but of course, it's there for you if you want to download it for yourself. All right, I think we're ready to get into this one. Ashley, are you ready to bring up the Dali images? Um, yeah, let's go ahead and take a look at our All images, right. and I'll just talk a little bit about what surrealism is. So uh, surrealism is the type of art that Dali 
uh, um, made, him and quite a few others in the early 20th century. And surrealism was really about expressing the hidden subconscious. And just like your dreams sometimes have imagery or events that don't really seem to go together, you know, in your dream, you may be in your kitchen, you go through a doorway and you're, in, you're at work and things just don't kind of fit together. Um, that's kind of well, what is going to be happening tonight. We're going to juxtapose some imagery that doesn't necessarily go together. Take a good look at this one. It's, I believe, it's called sleep and notice the strange wooden crutches that are holding up on um, parts of this face some of it feels a little too soft or like it's kind of sagging there on the right side that's kind of the direction we're going to be working in in fact we are going to draw a couple of those strange wooden crutches and these are types of crutches that Dolly actually had around the studio. He would hold his model's arms and legs in these crutches so that they, the muscles would be soft and they would look like they're floating and not under muscular tension. So we're going to work in a few different aspects of Dolly's art. Um, the image you're looking at right now has a, has a double image where there are swans on the water and the reflection of the swans are also elephants. That is not what we're going to be doing. So we're going to work with some of other some of the other attributes of Dolly's artwork, but not the double image concept. I tried to include a wide variety of Dolly's artwork, um, just so you could see sort of the breadth of his of the way he actually worked. Um, the image you're looking at right now is his version of the Last Supper. Everybody has to do a Last Supper, and Dolly's is pretty unique. So. Um, if you're not familiar with his work, I would encourage you to look at it. Again, like Piranesi, he's an artist whose technical skill improved all the way over the course of his life. And that's inspiring to me because I would like to feel as though I can continue to improve um, in my art making all the way uh, over the course of my life. Some things we cannot improve in, like sports you know eventually you start to go downhill there with age i but, disagree <laughs> matt's faster now than he's ever been but uh <laughs> maybe true but uh in terms of um technical skill and also even uh, ideation and composition i think we can improve in our art making from the beginning of our life to the end of our life and dolly's life ended in 1980 which is a few years after i was born so i'm glad that we got to spend a little time together at least on the same planet all right. If not actually together. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready to switch over to yeah, the Yeah, I think so. Let's go ahead and take a look at our paper and our materials. All right, so on the screen you can see both of the references, and of course we've got a, a, a glass and metal iPhone, and then also... Um, a cloth that has been scarily taped to a whiteboard. So don't let it scare you. What we're really looking at here, we're not going to really be drawing either one of these things the way we see them. We're going to be putting them together. So we're going to draw a soft, floppy iPhone supported between two of those wooden crutches that Dolly sometimes um, used in the studio, but also would include in his artwork. So we're really just looking at the cloth for its shape, and we're looking at the iPhone for its some of its colors and its details. And then we'll just try to um, see if we can marry or, ju or juxtapose these two, um, these two very different items, uh, but sort of synth synthesize them into one, which is a little bit different than a lot of the other surrealist work. Most of the surrealists would just put um, imagery next to each other that were disassociated. But Dolly liked to bring those things together. So we're going to start, I'm going to start with a pencil. Um, and it's a 2H pencil, so it's a little bit light. That way we'll be able to erase it and uh, move to our next material, which is, which will be um, Prismacolors. And I've got a small set, the 24 set of Prismacolors. And I don't even know if this is a whole set. I may even have some duplicate pencils in here. Um, but I've sharpened them because our drawing will be small. And so we'll need sharp tips on our pencils. Um, near the end of the drawing, depending on how sharp it actually is, you know, we are on a time limit. We only have 45 minutes. So I may bring out just a regular pen, just for a few little accents and harder edges. And uh, and then in addition to that, I do plan to use the white color pencil for some shiny areas across our screen. Um, but if necessary, I am prepared with a Posca marker. So it may make, it may make a, an appearance, and I think the yellow might actually make an appearance on our wooden stakes. So we are going to be using um, pretty wide 
variety of color. There'll be a lot of blue eventually in the phone, and then the stakes will kind of be a, an orangish brown. So we'll have a nice uh, complementary relationship in the piece as well. Okay. All right. I think that's everything I need to talk about material-wise. Uh, and do I know I'm going to need it in a need an eraser? So you find one over there. I'm looking in around. The drawer. Okay, I got one. Open the drawer. There's a. I got one. There we go. And I need a needed eraser because we're just going. Everyone, everyone needs a needed. That's eraser. right. That's right. So we're just going to dab our drawing a little bit uh, once we're ready to switch to colored pencils. All, All right, right so Real quick before you get started here. Yes. Um, Let's see. Oh, the paper. Big Blue Minamiku, ask me how the surfing is going. I'll talk uh -huh. to you about that in just a minute. And someone, it's rolled off the screen now, also said that uh, they once did a folding phone. And I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure Samsung did that once too. Yeah, they did. That's yeah. right. So it's very, <laughs> very similar to what we're going to be drawing, I guess, a, a, a soft screen. We're going to okay. make our screen look soft. So my paper is about six and a half inches wide as far as the, um, the drawing area. I guess it was perfect. I'm sorry. Did I say six and a half? Eight, eight and, and a half. half and it was nine but I, I taped over some of it so it was originally nine by six a okay. two to three ratio is what we're talking about any two to three ratio and i think this is the strathmore oh, how, how, it's the artigan it, i'm a, not sure if it's the artigan paper or not it's um, the, it's the par partially it's the gray, recycled paper yeah it's the gray uh yeah. drawing I, i've got a pad i'll check and see yeah if i think it's that's artigan, what it is it's pretty smooth pretty smooth stuff um all right, are you ready to go? Yeah, yeah. Let's All go right. ahead and bring up the timer, and we'll get right. we'll get if started. I can see the button. There we go. Forty five right. minutes. You're off. All right, so we're going to just start out, um, and you you know, because we're not following a reference exactly, uh, we're just going to be looking at the reference for color. Um, you may just have to watch for a second to see where things land on my paper. Okay. Let's see. Let's, this may, yeah, that's it. Yeah. This is what we're using here. So it's not the art again. Yeah, it's the toned gray. It does have a little bit of a thread to it. All right, so we're starting out with our crooked little wooden stake um, that is going to be underneath our iPhone where you can see in the reference the cloth is sort of taped. And um, just a little bit more on Dolly, I think that there's a lot of people who don't really understand Dolly. Um, and Dolly was heavily influenced by Sigmund Freud, who um, many of you know, uh, was really interested in the relationship between the ego and the id. Uh, <laughs> don't want to go too deep with this, this stuff. Oh, here we go. But uh, Dolly was really interested in finding a window uh, to our subconscious. And um, a lot of Freud's theories were focused on the dream world and that your dreams were basically a window to your subconscious. So uh, in a lot of Dolly's artworks, he's attempting to paint the subconscious um, through an understanding of dreamscapes. You so, think about it like your subconscious landscape. Right. So there's a lot of there's a lot of people that have theories out there on why Dolly did this or that, but uh, that's pretty much that's pretty much the core of um and you know surrealism didn't start out as an as a visual art movement it was really a literary movement so there was um surreal books but you can imagine how boring they must be reading hundreds of pages of words that are disassociated so i think it works much better as a it's a visual art form i bet you i could write one of those books <laughs> i bet you can the first sentence then it but right. was <laughs> 1967. Oh, this is brilliant, brilliant. Deep. All right, so we've got our our saggy our saggy iPhone, and I've sort of left the edges of the phone more intact, so we can see a little bit of a shape that we're familiar with. But then, sort of through the middle, it's sagging a little bit, like our cloth our cloth does. Now, like I said, we're not copying either one of the pictures, so we're not going to have as many wrinkles um, as we see in the cloth. We're just going to kind of suggest suggest those. So I think I'll, I'll have one here and one through here. Just a little bit of tension. These need to be really straight where the, where the glass cloth is gathering. There we go. And through here, keep you know, a little straighter. It makes it feel heavier. If you, if our wrinkles are straighter even than they are in the towel that I had taped to a whiteboard, which was a pretty soft piece of cloth. All right, there we go. 
So that's pretty much the extent of our shape. Now we're going to do a little bit of drawing, indicate some details on our phone, and then we'll jump pretty quickly into colored pencil. Okay. Now I'm not sure who I heard this from or where I heard it from, but um, I once heard that uh, Dolly would often hold uh, some forks or knives in his hand and uh, sit in a chair and fall asleep. Yes. And as soon as he fell asleep, he dropped. Was yeah, it a key? he'd hold a key over a plate or a platter. Okay. And what? Did, and that would drop, and then he would. It would wake him up, and he would have a vision. He felt like he was closer to his subconscious mind right. for a period of time. And incidentally, Matt, you'll be glad to know that I fell asleep on the couch right before I woke up and got in my car and drove over here. Oh my! So I'm gosh. accidentally in a surreal state First of mind. First of all. I could never do that. Uh, I mean, falling asleep during the daytime. My wife had to wake me up. Sleeping when it's dark. Yeah, she she woke me up, and I I, yeah. I was startled when I woke up. I thought I was late for work. <laughs> I was dreaming. Um, all right, going back to the question about surfing, I am really bummed about surfing right now because, uh, oh, as no. many of you know, a big hurricane came off the east coast, and I could not get anyone to go down to to the beach with me to surf. I didn't want to be out there by myself. Yeah, too uh, dangerous to be by yourself, the waves, right? But trust me, I have seen plenty of the social media posts from people I know who did make it to the beach. And how awesome and it was. And how awesome uh, it was. And I am rubbing it really in. bummed that I missed it. But it wasn't meant to be. I had other uh, duties and responsibilities, of course. So I missed out on, I think it was Hurricane Lee. Um, but That's right. boy, the surf report looked so good for like four or five days. And I missed all of them. And I missed the hurricane prior to that as well. So uh, I'm I'm hoping that there'll be another hurricane that comes, but does not hit the coast, <laughs> obviously, um, so that I'll have another opportunity uh, to catch some of those big waves. <laughs> hoping for a hurricane. You, well, yeah, but one that stays off the coast. I mean, th those, those yeah. last couple of hurricanes that came through were perfect. They didn't hurt anybody. They didn't, you know... Uh, cause any damage. Yeah, that's true. All they did was make some big waves and some high surf. So we're going to put a series of distorted squares, so none of them will really be squares. They'll be rectangles and trapezoids that just get really skinny and thin the closer we are to our two crutches and in a little bit more broad like a square as we move through the middle. And, um, you know, it's kind of like a, it's a grid pattern, basically. So I'm just going to do a row across the top, and that'll help me fill in, uh, fill in a couple of rows of apps below, uh, columns of apps below that, and then we'll put some of our favorite apps on here. And what is your favorite app? Oh, I don't know. Probably. I mean, it's probably like the podcast app. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty boring. I like to listen to people, middle, other middle-aged men talk at me. So uh, I do too. Yeah. I, I enjoy those things as well. The weather app. No, I do look at the weather. Speaking of weather, it was a nice sunny day here on Monday. When I got home, there was a huge branch through my roof. So not really sure what, how that what happened. happened. there? I don't know, but uh, the in, you know insurance adjuster had to come out, or someone who works for the insurance adjuster came out today, and tarped it and took pictures and all that kind of stuff. So it's uh, just a nice sunny, calm day, and so you don't need bad weather or hurricanes to sometimes have what appears to be like wind damage. How Maybe big it was, was just the a branch? Weird... Yeah, the wind. I mean, it was about fourteen feet long. Oh wow! And then um, it, it stuck straight down in my roof and then oh, snapped God. off. So there was like a two foot a two foot section yeah. just sticking straight up through the roof, and the rest of it was laying on the sidewalk. Oh, so it broke off. Yeah, it snapped off okay. when it hit when when it made made impact. Hey, a numbers girl, I'll take a tropical low, <laughs> but I can't get down to the coast this weekend. That's all right. Feeling pretty good about this, and you know your rectangles or i guess they're squares supposed to represent squares should be irregular have little wavy edges on them in places that's going to contribute to the soft feel of our um, phone screen we're we're juxtaposing glass 
and cloth. That's, Did you know if you took all the components out of the inside of the iPhone, this is what it actually does? It's actually just a, a skin. Yeah, pretty much. I, I, uh, I replaced my daughter's phone screen the other day. Man, the, I tell, these are my reading glasses. They're, they're, they're totally retro 70s. I love them. They definitely don't look, they, they, they definitely look like glasses a young man would wear. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And I've got three pair exactly the same, so I never have to look for them. And uh, they, I mean, I bought them from Amazon. I got a good deal on. Three, I like those actually. I love them. You can. I can wear look them down. over them. Right. Right. I can look over them to watch TV and look down right. into them my, to type on my computer. My reading glasses don't have that feature. Well, it's because they're not in style anymore. But yeah, my reading glasses look pretty cool. I had though. to type in <laughs> retro, you know, to even find these, and I couldn't find them anywhere else. You like, should have just town. typed in. I went to several uh, <laughs> drugstores, and none of them had these. This style of glasses. Yeah. And then I knew I was definitely out of style. All right. We've got our drawing <laughs> in. It's time to move on to colored pencil. So I'm going to remove any extra graphite. I'm sorry the drawing will get light um, because it is gray on a gray piece of paper. But we're going to start creating some contrast through value and color now. All right. Pure Love is asking, will you do a video about Delacroix? Uh, Delacroix is not one of our artists that we have chosen. I will go ahead and tell yeah, you that. I would like to. Uh, he's one of my faves. I think he's famous for having said that if you can't draw a man falling out of a five-story window before he hits the ground, you'll never make a monumental piece of art. Boy, was he wrong. Well, he was a monumental painter, but he didn't know about, uh, you know, there were no photographs. Right. You had to work fast back then. <laughs> you had to ca capture people on the fall. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, we had. He I would have hate us now having do. our, uh, having our, uh. Photogra what? He would hate us having our photographs to use. Well, um, having to, you know, that's work. why he lived in a different time. That's period, right. He was he? born for the right time, I guess. Um, I have two more artists to do. And after tonight, Ashley will have two more artists to do. So we have four total artists left. And I'm actually going to do right. three. But one of my uh -huh. artists will literally take 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. So that will be the my last go for this season. The, the, I will do the, two artists in one night. Ooh. Yes. And we don't have to add any time to the clock. No. I'll be able to do oh, both of them. I can't wait to see one what night. Matt has in store for us. All right. So this, uh, this home button, we're going to make it all the way black. Um, but we will need to leave a little shiny highlight in there, just like we see in one of our two reference images. So it feels nice and nice and shiny. There we go. We'll throw some white into that highlight at some point. And uh, I'm just going to kind of keep working all the way around the edges and our crutches. And then we'll do the screen um, last. Then hit it with some light and dark accents at the very end once we're done with our colored pencil. Hopefully. I know we have a time limit. All right, Mary Elizabeth asks, how much of a break do you take between seasons? It's usually about uh, five or six weeks. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's right. It's about five or six weeks. So, and we have a different theme each each season. I'm, I really don't know what next season's theme is going to be. We usually come up with that during the break. Usually, yeah, yeah during the break. Um, last season, if you missed missed it, was a game show. You guys mm -hmm. voted on prompts, and uh, then we had to do the prompt that you voted on. And if you missed any of last season, that's available on the YouTube, of course. Yeah, that was a fun one. It was hard. And no, it's not Keith Haring. Those are not the two artists I'm doing in one. Oh, yeah. One of them's not Keith Haring. He's going to draw some stick men for us. Yeah. All right. We're going to add a little white to there and burnish that in. I'm going to go a good ahead. Guess, though. I'm going to go ahead and hit the edge of my phone all the way around with a little bit of black. And I'm imagining this phone is more of the, uh, what is it called? It's, it's this space gray. If you're familiar with yeah. that option. Because space is definitely gray. Yeah, right, right. Um, Mary space Elizabeth gray. asks, do you still have the live lessons between seasons? Yeah, the live lessons go year-round. They never, never really stop unless we're sick right. or it's right on a holiday or something like exactly. that. Exactly, yeah. The live lessons are part of the membership program, so mm -hmm. those, are, those are consistent. Yeah, very, very much so. Now with colored pencils, you know, they're really meant to be layered and meant to be mixed. So we're just putting some base colors down and it's going to be a little speckly looking until we 
add layers of color or use our blender pencil and I don't know if I mentioned um, having a blender but you can also just use white for that but I, I will be using a colorless blender some okay um, Lord Engine says I like hearing he, although if you described him to me I'd probably have the opposite reaction and yeah I agree with that I, I like Keith Haring too I think that there is room for all different types of artists and just because uh, an artist creates artwork that looks on the surface like there's not a lot of skill doesn't mean that there isn't some skill there. Keith Haring's artworks um, were very balanced yeah, with the positive the, and negative the space. elements and principles really yeah. well, actually. They, they're, on the surface, they seem very simple, and they are simple, but um, the compositions are usually pretty strong. And um, like I said, there's a, always a good balance between the, the positive space and the negative space in Keith Haring's artwork. I mean, you know, he, he worked a lot with uh, variety and harmony, you know, and his lines harmonized everything. And then he found pops of color and other things like that to create variety and, and interest. So he was really, he was good. It was, they're simple, but not unsophisticated. And Ramon is asking, is there any chances you do one uh, drawing in oil or acrylics? I, I make videos uh, in oils and acrylics occasionally and yeah. post them here on YouTube. Um, we have some, uh, a lot of lessons on oils and acrylics in the membership program, but we're, we're not going to do that for getting sketchy because this is 45 minutes and that's really not enough time to create a painting. And we also, I mean, you can do oil sketches in, in a short period of time, but for this program, we really encourage um, or hope that folks are following along. And uh, yeah, painting materials are a little bit more restrictive in that way. So, well, we got a super chat. All right, numbers girl, and a comment to go along with it. Super. Yeah, thank you so much for that. A numbers girl, and her comment is: I am really enjoying this season. I feel like I'm getting an art history lesson each week. Thanks, guys. Yeah, good. That's what thank we're, you. We're trying to make art history fun again. Yeah, <laughs> I guess, you know, um, both Matt and I have taught art history and sometimes it's hard to keep people engaged. And uh, but I think uh, making art while we talk about art history really solves that problem. So don't get your textbooks out. All right. So I've just been hitting my um, light application of black with some white around the edges. And it just might get a little bit soft just within the nature of the material and the time limit, but that's what our um, pens and markers are for if we need them at the end. I'm really anxious to get to the screen. Let's see how we're doing it with 28 minutes. I'm not sure if I'm a, I might be behind schedule. <laughs> I kind of plan out in my mind what portions of the drawing I imagine I need to get to in order to, to complete them. And I wanted to do the pencil drawing in 10 minutes and we were right on target there. But uh, I may have slowed down. Yeah, it's, it's really difficult um, to, to have an idea in our mind and uh, try to make it come to life within 45 minutes live while lots and lots of people are watching. So, um, but we're going to do it. There, there are some variables involved when we go live here. We're not making excuses. We're going to do oh, no, it. No, 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 You've got this. Yeah, but I got sometimes it. we go over a little bit, and that's cool too. Yeah, because uh, we do another show right after this, but not directly after. We have a little bit of setup time, and uh, since we started a new season, our, our new um, artwork last week um, for the live lesson, there's a little bit of less setup and prep. Yeah, last okay. week we were all jumbled up, weren't we? Yeah, what was happening? We were <laughs> well, like I had dropping to go materials from the drawing and table mice. to the talking table, and we had to adjust the camera heights. Oh, that's right. And that's right. We don't have to do that this yeah, week. Yeah, and everything was getting unplugged and falling apart. Yeah, everything that could have, you know, been a problem. But we, I mean, we made it on live like two minutes late. Yeah. That wasn't a big That's deal. right. We were just a, all right, I'm going to switch to the blender a little bit and just hit these darker areas um, at either end of our phone. And you'll see that the value gets a little bit darker, even though this is a colorless blender. Maybe you can tell there in the corner. Um, it does 
push and force our our colored pencil material down into those little light gray spaces um, that are still peeking through our material. So I, it I appears. It the, what's that, Matt? I call it the magic of burnishing. Yeah, the ma yes, because it is really magic. It the feels way it works. like it. Yeah. yeah, and it's just just plain wax, just colorless wax. Um, and a few people are are remembering. What I completely forgot about, the Which, insect or spider that was in my shirt last Oh, night. yeah, that's right. Which I never found. No, we never located it. it but the next morning, I woke up and had really huge muscles and could climb up the wall. Oh, wow, that's... Uh, and shoot things out of my wrists. So that... Um, I'm thinking about that making a costume. attests to it, it having been there. You definitely had a spider in your shirt, because that's what happens. A radioactive spider, for now, sure. How many kids do you think of let themselves get bit by spiders and then let just, themselves and get then bit just by hoped that they would end up with uh, they, they su would superpowers right <laughs> probably the same number of people who have exposed themselves to radioactive energy in hopes to turn it into <laughs> incredible Hulk. i'll bet it's several uh, but it, incredible hook was gamma rays that's right right so um you have to be exposed to gamma rays to turn into the incredible hook um, we'll go get our ray guns out Pass that spider over here. I need those skills. All right. So I am hitting. I'm going to start hitting some apps. The first one's black with an X on it. Wonder what that is. <laughs> um, Barb asks, is Ashley pressing hard with a colorless burnisher? And I would say, yes, he is. What's that? Are, you're putting a lot of pressure on the. Yeah, on moderate the pressure. Spider. Right. Moderate pressure. Is, uh, for sure. All right. So oh, I was looking for the white and it was right there in my hand. So. Um, a good question here, Mary Elizabeth asks, what's the difference between a colored pencil burnisher or a blender? I, I, to my knowledge, some people label or some companies label the pencil as a blender and some companies label it as a burnisher. I think that some one company has a burnisher and a blender. Well, <laughs> I'm good not gracious. really sure what the difference what is. Now. Um, burnishing is actually just the process of basically compressing like the pencil layers into the surface and, of the paper. And we burnish, use that word in other um, other disciplines too, like in printmaking. Right. Um, and so you can burnish technically with any colored pencil. And before I ever had a colorless blender, I would burnish with a cream pencil or a white pencil. But mm. you can still burnish with any color, really. Um, a colorless blender is basically a colored pencil that doesn't have any pigment in it. And they're actually showing you one right yeah, there. Yeah, it's, it's so just, it, all it says is colorless. Right, so it's basically just the pencil without any wax in it. And, or wax without any pigment. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> Sorry, that spider bite. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so you can uh, use a colorless blender to burnish. And most of the time we... I use a colorless blender to burnish, but I'll sometimes burnish with other pencils. Uh, with colored pencils, you can you can put down layers and put light light layers down, uh, kind of like Ashley's doing right now. And then once you feel confident about your mixture of colors, the layers you've put down, then you can burnish it and give it more of a painted look uh, by eradicating the texture of the paper. Hopefully that's clear. And Kathy Anderson has sent us a super chat. Oh, Kathy, thank you so much. We appreciate your support. I hope you're enjoying the show tonight. Thank you so much, Kathy. And her comment is enjoying and learning so much from you guys. Love it. Thank you so much, Kathy. So I'm used to trying to use colors that like, this is the color of the phone and the message outline i'm trying to use some colors that we see in our in our sort of generic um photograph of an iphone they're pretty i think those are all apps that come loaded on your phone the ones that we see in the in the photograph and then you can also just throw some random colors in there as well so what we'll do what another black one phone do you have who me i'm assuming this is not you in the picture oh no yeah, that's not. That's I don't even somebody know. Somebody had to borrow is. somebody's phone to take that picture. They borrowed the photographer's <laughs> phone. Um, I I just have the um, SE, okay, the cheapos because we break them all the time. I mean, I've yeah. replaced two screens in the last six months. I feel like there was a time when you were walking around without yours in a case in hopes that it would break. Yeah, that, because that, I'm so gentle on phone. I should yeah. say that I haven't replaced my screen, just right. my 
kids my family screen because I can use a phone for three years and it looks brand new. I would say that, but I, the, tomorrow I would break my phone if I said <laughs> that. Um, you don't want to jinx yourself. Right. So we're going to make the, mine's old the too, background though. between these apps. You know, it could be anything. You may have a, some sort of a, a picture that you use for your background, and I certainly do. Mine is a tiger with snow all over its face. So it's great. Oh, it's great. I love big cats. I'm into the big cats. So in any case, um, we're just going to use blue, kind of a lighter blue color, similar to what we see in the app. So I'm using an orange right now. We haven't really touched the stakes or the sticks. So I'm just going to put use orange as a base color for that, which is not much darker than the value of the paper. So we're not getting a lot of contrast, but this is just a base color. And we'll put couple of other colors on these uh, wooden or will be crooked wooden crutches and you know what now that the phone is in there we can draw the the other side of the crutch so we can't forget that part it gives it a little dimension a little bit more overlapping there we go um, Beatrice and draw us and draw us I'm probably saying that wrong uh, says draw a human face for next season if you go back to season nine uh that was we had themes we each had a theme and my mm. theme was uh, facial features and faces so that's right uh, i drew a face facial feature each week and then for the final drawing of that season i did a face uh, yep uh, so you could go back and check that one out and uh, one season one. i did a man on a red piece of paper yeah it was a portrait so we've done a few portraits, not a whole mm -hmm. lot. I did a portrait of myself from the future, too. That, That's right. That was last season. That's right. <laughs> Old man Matt. Andy Griffith. <laughs> Everybody said I look like Andy Griffith. That's funny. Andy. That's your, one of your relatives. All right. We have got another super oh, chat. Yeah. Right. Hey. Brazen hey. Spirituality. Thank you so much. And Brazen Spirituality says, are there any significant artists that produced colored pencil art which sold? I always think of colored pencil me, uh, colored pencils just for kids medium. No, colored pencils are a, definitely a viable medium for producing finished artwork. And, you know, when we talk about sold, a lot of colored pencil artists have worked as illustrators. That's true, too. So, yeah. so maybe um, not as much like hanging on the wall in a gallery and uh, and and uh, and look at it while you sip wine and eat cheese, but you may have seen it a lot more often in an illustration that was reproduced, like children's books and things like that. Yeah, it, that's true, too. There, But there are some incredible colored pencil drawings that are out there. Hmm. Um, oh, yeah. You, you might have to look for a little bit, look for them a little bit. Uh, it seems like on Google, it seems like a lot of times when you do a search for artworks, they show you all different types of artworks. And a lot of times when you search for like colored pencil drawings um, you have to refine that search a little bit you might need to go for maybe realistic colored pencil drawings if that's what you're after mm -hmm. but there are some highly skilled artists out there that produce colored pencil drawings and um, you can also go over to the virtualinstructor.com and check out some of the colored pencil tutorials over there too um, so I, I would like to think that a lot of those drawings are, are not you know kind of based for kids um, mm -hmm. even though kids can enjoy them too, but no, I love colored pencil drawing and it is definitely a, uh, viable medium for creating art. It's, it's kind of a newer, if you look at, at the history of art, it's kind of a newer medium, yeah. uh, for making art. And maybe that's why it has that reputation for a long time. Watercolor I, I was, was going to bring that up was considered yeah, a lesser watercolor. medium, um, and uh, it was like a, a medium for studies, but right. not for finished art. That right. was the perception of watercolor. It for wasn't a medium a for serious time. artists. Yeah. Uh, and that we all know that's not true. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of mediums that are just kind of newer in the in the world of art. Um, so, yeah. So you are free to make colored pencil drawings mm -hmm. and be a true artist. All at the same time. Yeah. Do you remember our a student that we shared that I think went to SCAD, and uh, you know she had a sister, and they both took art. Yes. I and well. she did um, a 
when she was at SCAD, she was working on a colored pencil drawing and she brought it back to our high school to show us. And it was two people. One was her mm-hmm. in the picture and they were life size life-size colored pencil it was like a six foot long piece of paper you might have already been you might not have been there and she brought that thing in and i thought how many pencils has she gone through to make the because it was all heavily heavily mixed and burnished she was special she's special artist boy it was something else Um, i've never seen a colored pencil artwork that large before um and uh, ironically talking about colored pencils and students on the website at the virtualinstructor.com, if you go to the About Me page, you'll see a colored pencil drawing that was created by a former student of mine. And that is definitely a very refined piece of art. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you ought to check that out too. All right. So I've used, um, I used a, a brown line down the right edge, crooked little brown line down the right edge of our crutches. Um, because one thing about Dolly's artwork and some of the other surrealists is they were very stark in terms of the light, hard, strong light. And so, um, you know, just pretty much just use a relatively strong brown line to start to create a sense of light on our little stakes. And now I'm using a couple of blues. I've got a, what is a cerulean blue? It says light cerulean. And then I'll, oh, I'm going to take it back and a blue violet. This is violet blue. This is violet blue. Blue violet. That is not proper. I, I have, I take issue the with the label, right? We're supposed to put the uh, primary name first. Blue violet or blue purple. Right. Get them, Matt. There's no such thing as violet purple. Maybe, are you sure it doesn't say violent purple? <laughs> no. <laughs> it says violet blue. Violet blue. Oh my gosh, that's sacrilege. Right, call a company. Leave, drop them an email. So I'm going to put this cerulean in, and then I hit it with the violet blue just to darken it a little bit more. And of course, this will all get burnished together near the end. So, and it's getting crazy over here. I got pencils laid out everywhere. I almost forgot this top edge. The iPhone is melting. Maybe this is what happens if you leave your phone out in the sun all day. Leave it in the car. Don't leave it in the car. I've left my phone in the car, and it was so hot it wouldn't work until it cooled down. Well, we have another super yeah. chat. Oh, that's fantastic. You guys are Big awesome Blue tonight. Big Blue Minamiku. Thank you and so much. Their comment is, I have seen arguments on YouTube over objectivity versus subjectivity in art, where Dali has been used as a battleground. Interesting. What do Ashley and Matt think? Can any piece of art be judged objectively, or is all art subjective? Ooh, what well, a good question. I mean, Sounds like I you're think, wanting to, to bite on that one first. Yeah, I think it can be judged objectively. I don't buy into the everything is art because I call it art um, camp. So yes. We've got elements and principles of art. We've got things like balance and contrast, and art can just not work. Yeah, there, there is, art is, uh, people will argue that it's subjective because they just want their opinions to be heard. And I'm, I'm sure I'm stepping on people's toes and I don't care. I know. Um, I think art <laughs> can be judged objectively for sure. And if I, if I didn't believe that, if I was an art teacher and said that art cannot be judged objectively, then I would be a hypocrite. How because, would we grade? Right. You, you, we teach how to create quality artworks. And there's a discipline involved in the creation of art, whether it's drawing or painting, no matter what medium you're working with. And there, there are quality pieces of artwork and there are poor quality pieces of artwork. People make bad art all the time and people make good art all the time. Just like other th- handmade things. And it doesn't matter what type of art it is, non-objective, abstract, or, or bad, representational. Right? 
they all can be judged objectively. Um, and then where do we get our rubric from? Well, typically art can be judged based on the merits of the use of the elements and principles of art. That's why they're so core to uh, understanding in order to be a, a good quality artist. Um, so if you look through history, there are art, there are arts, there are artists, there are artists and pieces of art that have been created that people will look at and not understand. And they don't understand the premise behind it. They don't understand what, what the artist's uh, intention was. And they can judge that art in an objective way based on their own experiences in life or based on what they think is good or quality. And that's why there's arguments. That's why people argue mm -hmm. uh, whether or not a piece of art is good or bad. But artists typically can judge a piece of artwork based on the merits of how the elements and principles are used in the piece of artwork and then determine if it's a quality piece of artwork or not. And we don't apply that to movies or music. You know, people are more willing to say this is a bad piece of music. Right. You know, for some right. reason. But uh, but that a, doesn't mean that people can't like something that is not enjoyed by the masses. Oh, sure. Um, and there that's still also there. There are pieces of artwork that have been created. And I'm thinking of one in, in particular that it's a photograph that I won't discuss here. But it is really off putting to me. Yeah. And I, I don't I don't think that it I have a hard time calling it art, but. If you research the artist and you understand the background he was coming from and why he presented it in that way, then you have a better understanding of why he created that photograph, even though the art is repulsing to me and I would never want to even be associated with that art. I can still understand and appreciate where the artist was coming from and the statement they were trying to create or the statement they were trying to make. So hopefully that makes sense there. And, you know, I mean, it gives us something to work towards if we admit that we can make good and bad art. And I've made good and bad art, and I might be making bad art right now. I'm not sure yet. We'll see how it turns out. And, you know, a lot of people will look at a piece of artwork and say, well, I can do that. Well, of course you can, but you didn't. And the person whose artwork is on the wall is the one that did it. And sure, there are some methodologies in art that are easier than others to, to do. And, but that doesn't mean that, that art is not quality. Yeah, I, I mean... You know, not not all art is, I guess, um, the like sort of uh, not always about skill or level of skill. Although some skill needs to be there, sometimes it's also about the message. Like we brought up Keith Haring, mm -hmm. you know, his messaging was very strong, and his ability to communicate with pictures was very strong, and he used relatively simple shaped people to communicate those ideas mm -hmm. so similar all right let's see where do we want to go next i'm going to go ahead and hit our highlight and our home button with the white well okay somebody brings up jackson pollock and from what i understand about jackson pollock is he was uh an alcoholic and he was struggling with jackson alcoholism pollock the alcoholic and his <laughs> uh and his paintings the drip paintings were part of his struggle uh, to avoid alcohol. This is what I understand. Now, I, I don't mind telling you, I do not like his artwork at all. Yeah, well, it but, doesn't. It really doesn't and take that's a just, lot of that's skill. That's just taste. That's right. just taste. Actually, but, I do like one of his pieces specifically, but I can't even describe it to you because describing one is describing them all. But I can at least appreciate what the art on the wall represents. Yeah. Um, and if you don't understand what it represents, then you're probably going to be quick to judge it. Well, you know, Matt, that brings me to an issue that I have is should, you know, there's like I almost believe on certain days, I believe that uh, you should be able to understand what an, a piece of art's message is without having to hear about it with words. You know, should, that's yeah, that's a good argument. You know, that it should if it's a visual expression, then why do we need verbal expressions to to get people to understand what we're doing? So, so we should eradicate all artist statements. Well, and I hate artist statements. I hate <laughs> writing I hate them. And and I got this opinion from Tom Wolfe's book, The Painted Word. And he wrote extensively on Jackson Pollock's artwork in that book. And it really changed my views a little bit on artwork that requires a manifesto. 
yeah to be uh, to be understood so yeah, I, I don't know. Argument. I kind of go back and forth myself on, the, on I, that. But one. I do feel like no. by knowing a background and having an artist statement, it does add a level of interest yeah, to sure, the artwork sure. that might be missed without it. And, um, you know, Jackson Pollock's artwork was, I'm going to use a pen for a little bit, was non objective. And, you know, I don't like a lot of non objective work personally. But I'm not averse to it. I do like Kandinsky's artwork. It, but it's a little bit more structured. It gives me something to hold on to. You know, there's distinct shapes and lines. What about Mondrian? Pat, I, I, I'm, I'm, I like Mondrian. And it's partly because of the evolution of his artwork over time. You know, he started out as a representational artist. Gradually, he went abstract. And then you can see where his non-objective artwork is really a response to his abstract artwork. You know, so his art really went through um, an, a personal evolution. And, and, you know, to your point, part of the reason I like it is because I'm aware of that. Right. Not just the art itself. So, you know, like I said, I'm of two minds. It depends on what day you catch me on talking about some of that kind of stuff. Yeah. All right. Just doing a little bit of a little bit of dark line work in here just for some clarity. And I mean, I've partly been pushed by the clock. I looked up and saw how much time I have. So I might go back to the colored pencil, but uh, there's some... Um, some, some edges I really want to describe and get in here with the pen before it's too late. Okay. All right. We're shaking up the Posca markers now. Shake it up. And I want to put some highlights on my sticks. You know, keep pushing that high contrast. Um, now, are you going to put a cast shadow underneath it? Yes. Oh, that'll make a big oh, difference. Oh, gosh. I just put a mark on my tape just to test it, and now I can't. Is it dry yet? No. I'm going to get Posca on my shirt. <laughs> It'll right. be part of your dream. Yeah. There we go. We'll just let that little, these little. Oh, yeah. What a difference. Dry. So, like we had a dark edge, I wanted to give it a light edge. So, we've got, you know, three, three values in our little, our little crutches. Got to be pretty, pretty stark, pretty high contrast to be a dolly. Now, one thing that dolly did a lot was use reflected light and we're not really showing that in here because the parts are just so small but um, I love the way he manipulated light and our form with uh, with reflected light even when it wasn't there he always threw a little reflected light in you can tell it's almost it's pretty stylized in that way all right now I do have we've got about three minutes to oh, Blue go. Daisy brings up Rothko and that is an interesting one too um, Rothko, for those of you who don't know, did huge color field paintings where he, you know, some canvases were just one color. Yeah. Um, and I talked to one of my professors in college about this, and I've never seen a, a Rothko painting in person. And she told me that the reproductions of the Rothko paintings don't do them justice, that you have to see them in person to really appreciate them. Mm -hmm. First of all, they're massive. They're right. huge paintings, so they're going to have presence based on their size. And I feel like Pollock's works a little bit like that, right. too. You yes. can't, you've got to be in front. And I'm like I said, I'm not a Pollock fan, but I think they're more impressive if you're in front of one. But with the Rothko paintings, um, she explained to me that he would put on many, many layers, and there were just slight, slight differences in the colors that he added to the canvases. So when you looked at the paintings in, per in person, you could see some of the translucency of the layers. So the colors that were painted on the wall had this incredible depth, even though it might have just been one color or two colors stacked on top of each other. So I, again, the Rothko paintings are one of those things that we can look at and say, well, that didn't take very much technical skill. But there's still a place for Mark Rothko in the art world. Mm -hmm. You know, 
so uh, it is what it is. It doesn't have to be a piece of art that you like in order to appreciate it. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and I think if, if you're wanting to be an artist, I think it's a good idea to have an open mind and be slow to judgment and be open-minded, but also be willing to, um, you know, if you see bad art, call it for what it is too. So it's, it's not, uh, it's not necessarily we don't want to be guilty white. of the um of seeing the emperor's new clothes <laughs> right you know right. when it's not there so. but but like i said i can't um see someone's putting here rothko paintings in person is amazing so um so i have to take i have to take uh what i've heard from other people since i've never seen a mark rothko painting in person but not all of mark rothko's paintings were just solid colors there were there were some that had a little bit of composition <laughs> <laughs> or a couple of colors next to one another right and, but they were you know complicated one, one color two might, colors one color might take up a third of the upper part of the canvas and the other color maybe the the bottom two thirds right. so there was there was a little bit of thought as far as composition goes I feel like I saw, I feel like it was him that did a painting that was appeared to be just black but it was really six different blacks you know and you could see in person you could see really subtle differences in the temperature of the shades and it was kind of about that now Edie makes a comment here if you go to the met here in new york city and look at the 19th century paintings and see what great art actually looks like in person you'll never consider non-objective or, or <laughs> art again and we can appreciate the technical skill of the artist during that period for sure that's and we the, can strive to that's have that the art i prefer too. you know but personally. you got to understand that during that period that was before really photography was a thing and photography is actually what influenced artists to start creating abstract and not objective art because we had cameras when photography came around and if you think about the duchamp painting that's a painting of a pipe that says in French underneath it, this is not a pipe. That's the whole meaning behind that painting. It is not a pipe. It's a painting of a pipe. And uh, the whole abstract, non-objective movement was based on the fact that you were creating a painting. You weren't creating necessarily a repro reproduction of something from reality. Abstract art is a reproduction of something from reality, just distorted or abstracted in some way. Non-objective art is based purely on the, the um, you know, the elements and principles of art. They're, it's just made purely for an aesthetic piece of art. Uh, so even though non-objective art or abstract art might not be your style of art that you like, I still am hesitant to, to leave it out of art. Uh, it's still a, a form of expression. It's still a form of creation. Uh, so... I'm usually pretty uh, hard on non objective art. That's my opinion. I, uh, I, I, uh, I like it oh, when I find... And also, let me say this one thing. Yeah, go ahead. Also, if you think that it's easy to create a non-objective piece, try creating a non-objective piece that's successful. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. It's really hard to make a piece that impresses people. And so when I see one that I'm impressed by, I'm super impressed by it because right. uh, I think it's actually a little bit harder for that reason. I mean, I, I'm into some of the op art of the 1950s. Um, m let's see. Mamuka. Oh, my gosh. I'm, I'm butchering a name. It's something like... Mamuko Sudo, and she does non-objective artwork with just lines, and they are very impressive. Okay, and here's one. Kathy Penrod says, our university has an art museum, and there's an exhibit that is a toilet. Oh, time's the up. The exhibitor signed it, and the university put it on display. I don't consider that art. Uh, now, listen, might. first of all, if an artist did that, and it's in your art museum, and it's not by Marcel Duchamp, then... They, that artist is guilty of right. plagiarism. Right, your museum better it better be the only toilet that right. was ever signed because, and exhibited, um, or, it's, or it's Marcel Duchamp yeah. did take a, a men's urinal, signed it R. Mutt, and and created a piece of artwork that he called Ready Made. And you know that was kind of on a whim. And you know, he was on the way to a gallery when he stopped and bought the urinal. Oh, I didn't know that part. Yeah, of I think it was, I, mean, I feel, I might be getting this wrong. I feel like he was friends with the Guggenheims. Well, and he was going to a, a show that they were putting on. He's like, I know what I'm going to do. And he stopped at a factory and bought a urinal, and there was hundreds of them just like it. And, of course, his argument was, this form is beautiful, and everyone else is missing it. 
But as an artist, I can identify this beautiful form and raising it to the level of art. Right. That's uh, that whole movement of ready-mades, um, as Duchamp called them, is basically based on the foundation that as an artist, you can choose to make anything art that you want. Now, I personally think that Duchamp was just challenging the meaning of art. Um, I do too. He was a, I mean, he did great paintings, you know, like the figure descending staircase or new descending the staircase. I love that. And he was painting yeah. movement. Yeah. So he knew art. He was a but futurist. You got to remember, right, he was a futurist. Um, but you got to remember, he was also a grandmaster chess champion. He played games for a living. Well, the artwork that um, I'm referring to is called Fountain. So yeah. if you want to look it up, you can look for Fountain. Also, if you go to the virtualinstructor.com and you type in a page that does not exist on the website Ooh! it will pop up the dark web of matt's the site. fountain that piece of artwork that image and says that's a ready-made 404 for you because how about that ready-made oh that's of art. great that's um, great i don't know how many people have found that that's but, so uh, funny that's there okay so anyway all right well time elapsed but we were having such a good conversation i just kept going and so I got my kind of stark uh, cast shadow in. Uh, I'm pretty happy with this as a dolly piece. It's it's it feels heavy and and saggy, and um, and then also of course I think it's still still recognizable enough as an iPhone. So mm. one thing that uh, Dolly and the Surrealists often did is they included a distant horizon line um, as as a as a representation of the the depth of a of the subconscious mind and so their artwork always often looked like it was you know there's something really close and then a horizon or something else far away we saw that in the examples earlier so i'm going to put just a little line back here and uh i'm going to see i'm going to use a blue kind of like i did for the shadow i think um just to indicate distance because and i really like the artwork the way it is but we're working in a style I've lost, I've lost my blue. <laughs> I, I found it. I found it at the indigo. And since we're working in a style, I feel compelled to do so um, because Dolly would have made this choice. So I'm just going to put an almost flat line, maybe with uh, just a little bit of elevation, a little variation on one side. And uh, that makes it, I know it's just a line, um, but it makes it a little bit more like... A surreal artwork so all right very cool all right, there we go and there is dolly sure. by ashley <laughs> <laughs> ashley with an i no i'm just kidding <laughs> you should have grown out a mustache you know really i, th I thought about drawing a crooked long mustache across my face before i came over but mm. i was afraid i wouldn't be able to get it off um and lord engine has has picked up on the double meaning here the phone is a crutch, but sometimes crutches are indispensable. <laughs> Thank you for the interpretation of yeah. my dream. Well, I, thought I of needed it. that. I thought of it while you were that working. That is so on. I was great. Like, well, you know, our phones are kind of crutches, and <laughs> oh, we've got crutches I love in it. there. I love it. That's great. Um, very good. Got some claps. It looks great. All Hello, right. Dali. That was a lot of fun, and it was a little different because... I barely looked at the reference, you know, so right. I don't know if it was hard to follow along or you did your own interpretation, but the references were really just to show us what we were going to hold in our mind and try to, uh, oh, you know what? I need, I need a little, little dark mark underneath these, underneath yeah, if you these keep, shiny if reflections. If you keep looking at it, you're going to find all kinds oh, of things. Oh, gosh. Yeah. That's how it put, goes. Put the timer back up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we just need, you know, next to these shiny spots, we needed a dark. That's better. That's better. It made a difference. Okay. Very good. All right. Excellent. All, All done. Right. All right. We'll switch out over here then. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I certainly watch, enjoyed watching that develop, uh, as I'm sure you did too. Uh, next week, I will be doing the drawing. And uh, next week, I'm going to go ahead and tell you. Um, especially after tonight's conversation, it should be pretty good. So maybe <laughs> put a comment on there. Uh, I'll be doing Picasso next week. Yay! Uh, so, and I am going to be doing Picasso in the style of Picasso, the Picasso we all know, uh, not his earlier drawings and paintings, which were realistic. Um, I don't know if you know that or not, but Picasso was a very skilled artist 
Um, when he was like 10 years old. Right. <laughs> uh, so anyway, we're going to be doing a portrait. I'm not going to reveal who we're doing a portrait of. It will probably not look like the person we are doing, but we are going to have a model mm -hmm. uh, to look at. That's great. Um, but I'll be using oil pastels. I'm not entirely sure what surface I'm going to be working on at this point in time, but I'll definitely be using oil pastels next week to do the do uh, almost a dolly, the Picasso image. And the reason why I said that, somebody put something in the comment that uh, they said that uh, they really dislike the 50-esque Picasso style yeah, okay. artworks. So, oh boy. Sorry. Um, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> we're going to do that next week. We're going to talk a little bit about cubism too, because I think cubism is probably the most misunderstood agree for with that. A form of abstraction. Yeah, I would agree. It really doesn't have anything to do with cubes at all. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, Ashley, you have anything else to add? Um, I love the discussion tonight. So that was a lot of fun. It's I love making pieces of art, but maybe more than that, I love talking about art. So it was a great discussion. We went uh, all over the 20th century, and it looks like the fun's going to continue next week. So um, bring your comments and bring your questions, and we'll see you back here next Wednesday. Absolutely, and I hope you guys have a wonderful week. For those of you who got, are going to be with us in the live lessons, we'll see you in just a minute uh, over at thevirtualinstructor.com. Uh, if you like this video, make sure you like it. Don't forget to subscribe, and have a wonderful week, everybody. Good night.